Welcome to Conversations with Carolia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Carolia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, people, welcome back to the next episode of Conversations with Carolia. And yes, of course, I am Carolia. Today on the show, I have Lauren Hill. So Lauren Hill is a business and leadership coach for spirit-led boss babes. Now, I've known of Lauren through Instagram. You know, she's, she's been based in New Zealand for a while. I'm pretty sure she's born in the States and we'll find out. And we have paths have crossed. You know, we kind of move in similar circles, etc. And last year, I can't remember the exact day. I think it might have been October. Lauren went to Bali and, you know, as coaches do when they're on a trip to Bali, she was posting videos, she was promoting her work, she was doing her thing. And then one of the satire Bali-based accounts, which might have been Ubered on Acid, grabbed one of her videos, did a post on it. We're pretty mean. I mean, there's satire. You know, they take the piss out of the coaching industry. And to be fair, sometimes we all need the piss taken out of us, right? Um, but they went so far beyond. Um, I didn't realize it at the time because I only saw the post and the feed, but they did a bunch of stories that just kept repeating over a 24 hour period or so where they just, they made all this uh, new media out of Lauren's video and just doubled down on taking the piss out of her. And imagine if you will, if this happened to you uh, on Instagram on social media that a satire account picks up what you're doing, lambasts it, makes fun of it, and just goes hell for leather to take the piss out of you. How would it make you feel? What would it bring up for you? And how do we navigate this? Is there a place for satire? I think there is. I think we need to be able to take the piss out of us out of each other, right? But is there a point where it goes too far? Is there a point where it becomes just a really mean way to leverage other people for likes and follows. Um, so after it all went down and Lauren was going through her process, I'm like, hey, do you want to come on Conversations with Carolia and talk about your experience, talk about how it felt, talk about what you did, talk about the inner work and let people know, give them sort of the inside look behind the scenes on what happens when someone gets taken down on social media. Because remember, like when you go to comment, when you make fun of someone on social media, there is a real flesh and blood human who is behind whatever you're making fun of. There is someone with a beating heart. There is someone who cares. Um, so no further ado from me. Let's roll into the show and see what Lauren has to say. All righty, Lauren Hill, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my heart's being and I, I just feel so, yeah, so honored and grateful to be here and to be having a conversation with you to get deep and to get real because that's, that's what you bring. And yeah, yeah, because I didn't yeah, see well, what unfolds. That's it. Like when you went through what you went through last year, I was like, man, we got to talk about this because it's a, it's a thing that's happening all around the world where people are being called out, canceled, shamed taken the piss out of et cetera, et cetera, online as if there's no real person behind all of that. Yeah. Mm. So before yeah. we get into this, let's just talk a little bit about who you are, like what makes you, you, how you've ended up where you are. So where are you coming from at the moment? Where are you physically located? Okay. Well, right now I'm in Hill Morton Christchurch, yeah. <laughs> um, upstairs looking at this beautiful view. Um, I'm from, I grew up in Maryland in the United States and about, I was working in corporate advertising, climbing the ladder to success and, you know, doing all the things that I think I should be doing. And then mm. I, I had these awakening moments, had some spiritual awakenings and decided to leave my corporate job and come to New Zealand. And that was about 
six years ago now. And so I've been in New Zealand, like traveled around, lived out of a van, was doing the hippie life, living at yoga retreats, shaved my head, found God, you know, went on this big journey and then <laughs> met my partner, moved to New Zealand. I moved to Christchurch about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And I've just been building up my businesses here, my foundations and yeah, sharing my magic. So that's like a bit of my journey of why I am yeah. here. Yeah. So really what fast. Is your <laughs> business, like, cause you do business coaching, you do leadership coaching. How would you describe the business that you offer and the people you work with? Yeah. So ah, I work with mostly women. That's like the buzz and the path I'm on right now, empowering women. And it starts with having them discover who they are, their values, their vision, their mission, really like a self-discovering journey. And then taking that, their magic, like owning who they are, their personality, their past, their passions, like really who they are and what they've been through, taking all of that and packaging it in a business and something that they can offer people. So I call it monetizing their magic. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I do. I help women who are ambitious and heart-centered and spiritual and fun and bright and like anything multidimensional and help them take who they are, offer it to the world. And my background comes in marketing. I studied marketing in university and I worked in ad agency and I just love marketing because to, to me, it's just creatively expressing yourself mm -hmm. and sharing your message. So I really specifically focus on in business, like helping people with their marketing, be themselves, shine online, put themselves out there, be brave. Um, so that's that. And I also love the the practicals of business. Like I get so geeky when I talk about mm -hmm. business models and how to offer your things and package it and all of that. And mm -hmm. so that's like the business side of it. And then the leadership side is mm. empowering women to express themselves unapologetically. That's like a big huh. thing that <laughs> a lot of my clients tell me is of like that you're just so unapologetic and just me and my expression and my weird mm -hmm. unique magic self expands and activates people to express themselves mm -hmm. and, and not give a fuck about what people think so this conversation right now about yeah. online bullying is so potent it's such an initiation yeah um, so that's yeah that's the main work that I that I offer that I so love I'm curious right because you're from America like I spent about seven or eight years living in North America I was in Canada right but it's still yeah. out of New Zealand and what I noticed, because I have a tendency to go big and to want to shine and do all of that. And in New Zealand, we have this thing called tall poppy syndrome and New Zealanders have this tendency towards being reserved. And what I discovered when I went overseas and lived in North America, I felt like I could just be more unapologetically me and bigger <laughs> and shinier. And it was like the culture supported it. So mm. as an American who's mm. moved to New Zealand, who's sort of in the business of helping people to shine, what do you notice on a cultural side of how Kiwis are compared to say how Americans are? I love that you brought that up. It's <laughs> it's so true and it's so obvious to see coming from the outside perspective and coming in. I like that you've experienced and seen it. So like the American culture is, especially because I grew up in right next to DC, which is really ambitious. Both my parents are entrepreneurs. Like, it's just like, let's go, let's go big. Um, so growing up in America and the American culture is like, be individual, be unique. There's a lot of people there, right? It's lots of people. So it's like, you got to stand out. You got to be big. You got to be different. You got to like own who you are. A lot about self-expression and individuality. That's like a big mm. value of the culture in America. And so coming to New Zealand, <laughs> um, has been such a journey to notice the energy and the expression of people here. It, it, every time I learned something new, it kind of started mind blowing me when I learned that most schools wear uniforms. That's like, you know, like, okay, let's all wear the same thing. And I was like, what? It's like self-expression. Um, so I feel like I need to share a little bit about my journey about this, because when I came to New Zealand, I was like wearing rainbow, wearing hippie clothes. And I was like, wow. And then I really came here though to like ground and to come into my spiritual journey. And I think that is something that's really special about New Zealand, that people are really connected to the land, really humble, really like inward. And um, and I started getting like really influenced by that because I've been here for six, six years and I was like living in the ashram and started wearing black all the time and very like quiet and subdued and coming <laughs> inward. And, and it was good for the journey, like to go in and I noticed that when first arriving here, the first couple of years that my bright energy, like triggered a lot of people of like, whoa, like people weren't used to it. People weren't used to like the loud and the proud. And they were either like, 
like appalled or like, oh, they loved it, you know? So I, mm. that was the experience that I saw. And I think the Kiwi culture, because it's so small and isolated and the culture is very, um, yeah, like you don't want to stand out because it's not safe and like subdued. I've seen it huge in terms of like the clients that I work with, working mm. with Kiwi women and how like they don't want to express their sexy or like wear a lot of makeup or like they don't, they're scared of attracting men or they're, you know, they don't want to stand out. And that's been so interesting to see. And I think, so I used to, my first business is Camp Wonder Girl, working with young girls, ages eight to 12. And I did an online program during COVID for the girls. We had half Kiwi girls, half American girls. Mm. And I really got to see the difference <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah so, that'd be fascinating like and did they vibe off each other did the kiwi girls kind of get bigger and did the american girls kind of go more humble or what happened we didn't have long enough together for that to balance yeah but the american girls were like oh, i want to go first i want to go first like leaders like let me go let me go really excited talkable had lots of ideas the kiwi girls were all like quiet and like you know, so, but I, I, I did this like pen pal. So I paired a Kiwi girl with an American girl and they mm -hmm. did like a project together, like on to show on to everybody on the computer. And it did when they worked together, like closely, there got to be this kind of a, assimilation, right. Mm. Of she kind of helps her up and she kind of brought her down. So I did see that a little bit with there. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So, so you're already like, large and unapologetically who you are it's kind of your what you're trading in in your business and you're doing that within the culture of New Zealand which seems to be a little reticent is that the word um so you decided to go to Bali last year why did you go to Bali what was Bali about for you okay so <laughs> growing up like heavily influenced by the media especially social media Bali I had this perception in my head of what Bali was like and what it and so for me, it was like, Bali is the dream. It's paradise. And so I have been wanting to go to Bali for so long. And as soon as like after COVID happened, we could travel again. Me and my partner were like, let's go to Bali. We planned it for so long. I really just wanted to live like the digital nomad laptop lifestyle, like dreamy paradise, ca cafes, yoga retreats, all that stuff. Um, I know there's a huge spiritual community there as well. So I was excited for that. So yeah, me and my partner went to Bali. We had six weeks there. Mm -hmm. And that's a decent chunk of time. It wasn't yeah. like you were just going for a 10-day holiday. So you were going to be working, I'm guessing, while you were there. Were you still seeing clients or running group programs or over that six-week period? Yeah. yeah. And I really, the intention was I want to see what it's like to live and work there. So during that time, I was planning a huge launch, like the biggest launch of my longest, biggest program called the star mastermind, like an mm -hmm. 11 month journey. I was hosting an event like two days after I got to Bali, I was like having an online event. And the whole time I was in Bali, I was going to be launching it. Cause it was like, I want to be in Bali vibes. I want to bring the good energy. And as I launched this new thing. So it really was like, I want to work and travel and, mm -hmm. and, and have that balance. So this is kind of like you testing the waters going, can I do it for six weeks? What does it feel like? Because this is where I might want to go as a digital nomad running my business online, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So you got all these <laughs> ideas in your head about what Bali means and what Bali is like. What was it like when you actually arrived there, like the first day or the first two days? What was it like landing? Well, we didn't actually get to land the first couple of days because, because we had problems getting into Bali from Vietnam. Um, so we had to like, it was just a really rocky start. We had to like sleep in Vietnam customs overnight. We had to go fly to Thailand, spend a couple of days in Thailand. They lost our luggage. So it was already like really rocky. This like dream to go to Bali. It was like already off to a really rough start we get to Thailand finally we get into Bali and it's like an absolute miracle and I was like it's only up from here I can't get any worse and we were so excited we got to Bali we got to yoga barn we were staying there for a couple days mm -hmm. um I know that's like the big hub with all the classes and so I was like oh so excited it was so, so is beautiful. yoga barn in Ubud is that in Ubud yeah Okay, cool. So you're in Ubud, yoga bar. I've heard, I've never been to yoga bar, but oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard of it. It's the place. It's the big place. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh my God, you know, such a big, I acknowledge that I had a huge expectation of what Bali would be like. And mm -hmm. there were people that told me, they're like, 
remember like it's kind of third world country you know it's a third world country like just remember that and and I was like yeah okay uh but it's paradise so anyways I get to Bali and I was so excited and I was there for two days and we were like in yoga barn and kind of still landing like needing to ground after that kind of rocky start um Mm -hmm. the first two days were amazing we were in Ubud we were so excited and then we got really bad Bali belly we got we got really sick with some mm. you know bacteria infection of something and we knew yeah. that that was like a thing to watch out for and we didn't drink the ice cubes or whatever but we still got it and then we were about sick for about like poop pooping and puking for like a week and a half mm-hmm. <laughs> a week that and a, it's a long time like yeah you're gonna be careful with dehydration and like yeah uh, yeah and me and my partner both had it really bad and there was there'd be one day where I'd be feeling really good I'd be like, I think it's gone and then he, he was like bedridden and then mm-hmm. he was healthy and I was so we kept switching and it that kind of like yeah skewed the whole thing because we just were stuck in the Airbnbs the whole time and it was so hot and we were just like you know ordering ordering food oh. and trying to trying to stay alive uh yeah really intense yeah. sickness yeah yeah okay so you t- so now you've had like the two or three days of hassle getting in sleeping in the airport flying everywhere don't even know luggage might be lost then you arrive now you've had a week and a half of Bali belly with the vomiting and the diarrhea and all that then what happens <laughs> and then we finally get healed and we're like oh, we're healthy we go to we go to Uluwatu and we stay at this like pink hotel it's called Pinkoko it's like straight out of one of my fairy tale dreams and it was like so beautiful and so we get there and it was my birthday I turned 29 on the 29 and uh, that was yeah that was that was a it was such a dream day it was like everything I loved I had a couple friends we went to this cafe all this good vegan food my partner rented us a boat and mm. we went out on a boat popped some champagne we were snorkeling it was an absolute dream day and I was like wow like life is it felt like so ethereal, like, whoa, this is crazy, you know, and so beautiful. And then we ended up settling down a little bit. Um, while I was in Bali at that pink hotel, I made this video. Jack was like, here, record me. Um, I was like, here, record me in this hotel. And I just mm-hmm. started like, I didn't know what I was going to say. And I just started floating around the room like, you can live your dreams because I just had my birthday and it was this like crazy experience. So I was like wanting to inspire people with this energy of, oh my God, like your dreams are possible. Ah!" And I finally like got to experience the Mm. expectation or the paradise or the dreaminess of Bali. Mm -hmm. So So you're high in essence, you're like high on living this dream you've had for a long time, coming through the customs disaster, the health disaster. You just had the perfect birthday. You're in the pink hotel and you're just like, (laughs) oh my God, you too. If I can do this, you can do this type thing. Yeah. 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 Right. I was so on you, a you high. Make, yeah. So you yeah. make and this I, yeah. video. <laughs> <laughs> make this video. I was like, woo. And there was something in the video. I was like, oh, I'm not sure if this is like the most aligned. Cause I wasn't really thinking about what I was saying. And I was like, oh, that, that doesn't really feel really good. Cause I was like, oh, if you're not living your dream, like, you know, you can. And I don't know. I just didn't feel fully wet good. But I was like, you know what? Whatever. It's fine. At that time, I was like posting every single day, like kind of hustling. Cause this was a big program. I was launching I was mm-hmm. posting every day I wanted to get the energy wanted to get the hype you know wanted to really bring amazing women into this program and so I was like I'll just post things and I just was like going for it and whatnot so yeah I was on a mm. high mm. all right so you post this video that you did have second thoughts but didn't listen to them and then what happens after you post the video okay so <laughs> so then We get to this new villa and this villa has like, it's again, what fulfilling one of the dreams. It has all the roses and the bathtub and in the pool. And we're like, wow, we get to this villa. I was so excited. We're about to go to bed for the night and I'm going, sitting on the toilet, a little bit more of the Bali belly coming out and I go on my Instagram. I got a message from- sitting on the toilet, right? (laughs) (laughs) You sit on the toilet, pooping, checking Instagram, you know? Yeah, exactly. So pretty pretty vulnerable at this time open my phone I got a message from some random girl that I don't know and she mm-hmm. was like hey I'm so sorry people are so mean and I'm like what are you talking about like what and mm. she was like oh there's an account I don't know if you haven't seen there's an account that's like making fun of you um, I'm so sorry and I was like okay do you remember what it felt like in that moment before you knew or before you saw like hearing from her 
it felt like my heart sank into my belly. Like, you know, when you're on a roller coaster and it's about to go down. Yeah. It felt yeah. like this Oof. sinking feeling in my belly of like, oh, fuck. Yeah. And you're still sitting on the toilet. Yeah, I'm on the toilet <laughs> in my and I had just like I, I've had a lot of digestive disorders like in my past and lots the huge journey with healing my gut. And it's just interesting that this happened, this massive experience, which we're going to get into this trigger while I was in like kind of this this dark place on the toilet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I go oh. so I go to this account this account has like 15,000 followers I've never seen the account never heard of the account before um and they've taken that video of me in the pink hotel room and you're and, in a bikini in that video right as well yeah, so yeah you're leaping around super high on the high of your birthday etc in the bikini in the hotel room yeah so they've got yes. it on their account did they what did they say so they took the video and they posted it on their stories and they basically like edited it and remixed it. And it was like, this is your power that, you know, like editing it and making it like all trippy out, like all these different colors and like, and they pretty much posted it and reshared it like maybe 30 times in different ways. Yeah. I yeah. saw that. Like you saw when it. I sent, it, I sent yeah. it to you. Yeah. When you sent it to me, because I'd seen the post, I'm like, oh, that's me. That you know, like but kind of satire can kind of, but but then when I saw the fact that they'd posted the story 30 or 40 times and remixed and the way they'd made it look, it was like that's like taking a stick and poking it into the wound you know, multiple times. What, yeah, what did it feel like when you saw the story? Are you still sitting on the toilet when you're looking at these stories? Yeah, I'm on the fucking toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you didn't, you hadn't moved, you hadn't pulled up your, you were just like. <laughs> yeah, oh. I'm on the toilet. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I was watching the stories. It was like. My first feeling was like, oh my God, this can't be happening right now. Like, this isn't real. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. it felt like time kind of stopped. And I was like, what yeah. the actual fuck? And it felt so humiliating, mm. so embarrassing. And I felt so much regret. And, mm. and, I felt like I was in high school again. Like I literally like got flashback to high school of like rumors and reputation and like, yeah. And it was, it, it was, it was, it was such an out of body experience. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think you disassociated at that time? Like you say, it's like an out of body experience. Like if you feel into it. Yeah, like I had, I, I felt like immediately I kind of like zoomed out and was like, mm. whoa, I was like almost like looking down at myself, looking at it of like, whoa, yeah. what? Yeah. It felt like I was in like a, a, like in a scene of a movie or, you know what I mean? Like I was wa like being the witness, like watching myself experiencing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it felt so like, is this really, is this really happening? And like, mm -hmm. I, it was like a nightmare. Like it was, the, it was like, I didn't want it to happen and it was happening and it was like, no kind of that shock yeah yeah and so when do you get off the toilet like what <laughs> after I watch all the stories get off the <laughs> toilet I I my partner is on the brink of sleep if not sleeping at this point mm -hmm. in bed I come in to the room like flail my body on the bed and I'm just like that's when it kind of hits me and that's when I kind of get my mind in it and I'm like hysterical I'm like ah, like screaming I've never heard these sounds come out of me before it was so so intense so dramatic and mm. he was like what's going on what's happening and it was I showed him it was just that's when all the emotions started flooding in like whoa and crying and rage and confusion very confused and just like almost hysterical mm. yeah <laughs> and yeah yeah and so how long did that go on for that night? 
because it's like I'm guessing it's getting toward midnight when this is happening your partner's already had been asleep yeah. how yeah. long did you sleep at all that night it took it was like maybe in maybe an hour of just straight crying I called my mom helped me process some things crying yeah. processing my partner he was getting really angry he was like I'm going to find out who did this. And I'm going to, he was like trying to find, go on the black market and, you know, trying to fix it and stuff. And he was like, I'm going to tear it out, you know? And, and, um, but then also was like, okay, fuck it. I just need to be here with you and your emotions. And then he held me, held me crying. So grateful for him. He's yeah. Really good at holding space. Lots of, lots of emotions. Blah blah. blah. Um, I love that you called your mom, you know, like you, that she was the one that you reached out to and she held space for you. Yeah. Cause Am yeah. I remembering correctly? Is your mom also in the coaching world or in the person? Yeah. 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 My mom is like executive next level coach. She's been coaching for like maybe 35 years. She's a coach trainer and she's a coach for like executives in the government or something like mm-hmm. she's like top of the top with coaching. So that's how I got into coaching from her. And she's so good at holding space and help me process things, you know? So of course she's yeah. like, she's my go-to, you know, she's a rock for me. So mm. her her feelings were just like, she was appalled. She was like, what? Like, couldn't believe it. But was like, this is not about you. You know, this is them and their shit and all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's also going to trigger you and your shit, isn't it? Even though it's not about you, it's one thing to intellectually know that, but then there's yeah. all the stuff that's yeah. still going to bring up for you. Okay. So you're crying hard out for an hour or so. You did get to sleep that night. Like, yeah, I think maybe at like four or something, but it was, I was trying, it was restless because the thoughts yeah. in my head were just yeah. so negative, like not wanting to exist. It was like, this is, you know, so, so yeah. dark. And I was in this dark hotel in this foreign country and this, you know, just stuck in this, it felt like stuck in the, like a prison, my mind and my body and my experience felt like a prison. Mm. So, so uncomfortable so it was hard to sleep I did I think I fell asleep at four or something and yeah I woke up just like oh, no it was real like it all hit me again when I woke yeah. up yeah and so as you're going through this what were the tools or the practices that you were drawing on as a coach right because no you help people with this kind of stuff and here you are and you're in the middle of it yourself do you remember what was most beneficial for you or what really helped in those moments it was having a space to fully feel my feelings and having the space held for me. Yeah. And yeah. so the next day I called my, one of my best friends, um, her, Tosh. And so she's really good at holding spaces. She does like amazing journeys. So I was like, I just need a full fe- four feelings check-in process. And so she just, we're on zoom. I was just releasing the anger, releasing the rage because mm. a lot of rage came up that I haven't tapped into. So releasing the rage, releasing, screaming, crying, letting it all come out. That was the most helpful thing. And then just talking about it. Like I'm a yeah. talker, I'm a speaker, emotionally processing it. Cause there's so much emotion energy in my body. Right. So mm-hmm. just needing to wanting to, wanting to, wanting to really just get it out mm-hmm. um, in a, in a safe container. Yeah. And how was your mind making meaning or making sense of what had happened? Was there self-recrimination going on or like, yeah, what was the mind saying to you? The mind. Okay. Because this, because this is now that I have like a lot of process and I reflection on this, this experience was a massive trigger, like a re almost re-traumatizing myself from past being bullied in high school rumors, reputation, you know, like the 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 biggest fears or doubts of the ego of the mind that I have were being like thrown at me so Mm -hmm. those old thoughts and wounds and patterns of I'm not good enough it's not safe to be me Uh, my expression isn't wanted I'm stupid I'm immature you know all of these thoughts I'm not good enough it was just constantly on repeat Mm -hmm. it it, like it re-traumatized that Mm -hmm. and that that was just continuing going on like so were you aware at the time because you're in it it's happening it's intense all of the stuff were you aware at the time that it was re-triggering re-traumatizing old stuff from high school that hadn't been completely dealt with yet or was it only in hindsight looking back that you were like oh shit that's why it was so intense it was the Mm. old shit coming Mm. up as well Mm. I think 
I feel I intuitively, like my spirit energy knew that it was okay. This, this is a big thing that I've experienced. Yeah. But I was so in it. You know what I mean? Like I was yeah. so in it that I just needed to be in it and get it out. Mm -hmm. And I also knew intuitively that it was an initiation of mm. like, okay, this needed to happen. So yeah, in the moment I wasn't like, oh, this is a trigger. Okay, cool. You know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Like I, I knew, but I just needed to just do it and go yeah. through the process of it. Yeah. Um, so what was yeah. the next week or two weeks like as you did deal with all the stuff that it brought up, those old thoughts and the old emotion, et cetera? Yeah. yeah. What was that week, two week period like in the immediate aftermath? And you're still doing your launch, right? You're still meant to be focused on your launch. You're still in the middle of being in Bali for, yeah. you must have had another couple yeah. of weeks left in Bali. Yeah. We had about two weeks left, two and a half weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah so did a lot of emotional processing, got on the phone with a lot of friends, talking it out. I had my mastermind that I was in as well with a coach that I highly trust and all these women. And they were, I was sharing my experience and they were just so much pouring of love and reflection and questions. And so I had a lot of external support to like hold me in that. Mm -hmm. And so I, it began this process of like starting to question everything, like questioning, oh, like doubting, questioning, like in this kind of void of like, whoa. And then I knew that I needed to be around people. I felt really alone, even though I was with my partner, I had all this online support. I needed to be like with people. So me and my partner, we booked a retreat uh, in Bali and Uluwatu with these two amazing women. And we booked a retreat so it was like a week long retreat and we get there and I'm just like, all right, I'm just ready to be held. And that was a really great process mm. of being held in community. It was a really intimate, maybe eight of us. We did cacao yoga every morning. We had sharing circles. And I feel like I just allowed myself to just oh, be held and not think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm, yeah. Did you, did you, what did you do with your Instagram account immediately? Cause were you getting messages from people? Were you reading the comments on the satire account? Like what was your oh, yeah. on? How were you um, interacting online after it happened? The day, the night of, and the day after, I was checking this social media of like, what else did they post? What else did they post? Because they started posting it, like screenshots of my website and all my programs. And then my friends started messaging them, and they started like posting and and sharing photos of uh, my friends' conversations that they were having with my friends. And it was just like three days of like they were constantly going and. Yeah, the first day or second day and third day, I think I was, because I was still alone with my partner in a villa and I was just needed to see what else were they saying? It was yeah. this weird, like, thing possessed me. Like, I just need to know, like, what else are they saying? Like, what else, like, what else is wrong with me? Like, I was feeding it and I was letting it. And then after like two or three days of that, I was like, okay, I get it. I understand their perspective. Now it's time to shut that off and go in and do my work and reflect and re reassess this and find out what's true for me and do the deep healing. So that's why I went on the retreat and I totally shut off, stopped my, stopped my phone, didn't go on my phone at all for a week. Mm -hmm. So good to like get away from the yeah. online world, the virtual reality and remember this reality of this body and community and nature, lots of time mm. in nature. So that was so healing to just reground. Yeah. So I think this is also interesting is that they didn't just do the post. And they didn't just do 30 or 40 odd Instagram stories. They kept going with, yeah. you know, they kept shaming or humiliating or taking the piss, you know, out of you. Good Kiwi expression for those of it, those yeah. of you that might be listening yeah. in the States. Um, and, and the fact that your friends were sort of writing to them and I guess sticking up for you. And then they're publishing those conversations as well. Mm. How did that make you feel the ongoing, relentless feud, you know, and they kept going? But it wasn't just a one-off thing, you know? It felt it felt like I was being attacked. Yeah. And it felt like it wasn't going to end. And I was mm. scared to see what else they would do because it became like their thing. Then there was another, another post and they were like, this is what's wrong in the coaching industry. And it was like, the caption was like, like Lauren Hill, like this is for you. You know, it was like, it was constantly like trying to 
just focus, focus on me and go for it. So I felt, I felt really attacked and also like, oh, wow, they're on a mission. And it was, I was scared to even look at it. Like every time I was like, oh, shall you look at it? You know? So yeah. that's what it was like for me. Yeah. Did you reach out and directly message the owner's account at any point? Because I know, I know your friends were, did you do that? Did you respond I didn't, to comments no. on the post? No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't respond to anything. I just, I didn't want to fuel the fire. I didn't know what to say. Cause I've mm -hmm. never had such, I've had like shame comments here and there online and, you know, little things. And, and I'm like, cool, I'll process it. And I usually respond, but this, I just, I didn't, I had no collection of what to respond or say. And I didn't feel, yeah. yeah I just, as soon as I saw them post something, I blocked them, but it didn't yeah. stop them from, you know, sharing or doing other things. Um, yeah. And did yeah. you get um, messages coming into your direct messages from people who'd seen that stuff and were taking the, like being mean to you in essence? Yeah, there was, there was about on my original post, there was about 15 comments, all from, all from dudes. Um, all these comments, all from guys saying really horrible things, mm. deleted all of them. I got a message from someone saying you need therapy. You know, you're, you're selling coaching. You're fucked up. You need therapy. I got a couple other messages, but mostly just yeah, mostly just comments on their account, hundreds yeah. of comments saying horrible yeah. things, hundreds of, you know, people responding and yeah. So yeah. mostly on their side, only a couple on my side. Mm. Okay. So you've turned off your phone. Did you shut down your Instagram account for a while as well? You just kept it going. I didn't shut it down. I kept it there. I just, I just stopped posting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you have, you've gone on retreat turn off your phone, taking a break, you're seeing this as an initiation. And, you, and what I'm hearing you say is you're going, okay, what's my inner work around this? What's it bringing up for me? Where do I need to go? How long, like, how long was the process of doing your inner work? And where did you get to with that? How do you see this whole event now? Because it must be about five months later. We're, we're doing this five months later. Uh, yeah, it was in like, no, it happened in like November. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, four months. Yeah. Four months. Yeah. So got back to New Zealand and I was like, okay, time to, time to heal, time to process, time to do the work. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess like it was okay. When I got back to New Zealand, the, my full number one priority was like, let me just get back into my body. I was very ungrounded when I was traveling. Cause I was like, all over the place, all that emotion. So I was like, let me just come back to myself. I started practicing yoga every morning, taking care of myself, my body, like just full like rituals, self-care, nourishment, nurturing. I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. What I realized when I got back to New Zealand was I felt because of the, the visa stuff, the sickness, the online, I felt very unsafe. So my nervous system was so activated and mm. so like scared and unsafe. I was like, oh, so number one was let me calm my nervous system and come back to a relaxed state. And then mm. from that place, it was, okay, how can I reflect and continue to process this? So most every morning I was doing a journaling ask myself deep questions, the hard questions, who am I? What am I? Why am I here? What do I value? What was true about this for me? Why did this hurt me so much? Deep, deep questions, self-inquiry, sitting in meditation, feeling, journaling, crying, journaling, crying, talking to friends. Uh, that was a lot of the process. Um, I saw a couple psychics. I just needed some kind of like, you know, I want to see the future. Like, how can I move through this? And a couple psychics were helping me. Um, Mm. Oh, and then I was like, and then, uh, you, <laughs> you came up and was like, how can I really be held to go deep into this? Cause I was like, I knew in my mind, this is an initiation when you shine big shit happens, traumas, triggers, whatever. I was like, how can I alchemize this, turn the shit into gold and go deep mm. and get some stuff from this. And I was already thinking about working with you. And so when when you, you think when you found out about it because I random, yeah. randomly <laughs> um, met your ex partner or something and told him that's, about it. That's right. Okay, so for, for the viewers listening, here's the story. I went to NZ Yoga Day. My ex partner was there, and he bumped into Lauren. And I, Lauren, and I had known each other online. Anyway, my ex partner talks to Lauren. She tells him what happened, and then he tells me, and I'm just like, 
my gut feeling was like, oh, I need to be there for this woman. You know, she's doing great work. And, you know, just a sense of wanting to support. Um, so I ended up reaching out to Lauren. So full disclosure, I reached out. We had some conversation and she ended up stepping in and doing three weeks of mentoring with me. Um, back to you and where you're telling the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It was, And it's so funny because right when I got to yoga day, there was this like tall man there and he was like, how are you? And I was like, I don't know why I just, he felt so safe. And I just felt like I had to say, yeah. And, um, and I think it was all divine because then it brought me for you to learn about it. Cause I don't know if you would have found no, out. I didn't but, know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it was just so perfect that we had that. And then yes. So and then funny, we went, those connections, you know, cause he is really good at holding space. It's one of the reasons I fell in love with him. He's freaking amazing at being able to do that. Yeah. And there you go. You bumped into him at yoga day. <laughs> like awesome. Okay. Divine yeah. timing. Um, so, so then I get, uh, okay, so we go three weeks together. You help me process some stuff, went deep into the emotion of it. Mm. And like I said, my favorite thing, the, my favorite thing, the deepest healing I find is that kind of somatic experience yeah. of the feeling being held. And that was a deep process that we went through. And I really got to see this, this inner, this inner hate within me, like hate toward myself, mm. go really deep, deep into my own yeah some scaras, unconscious beliefs, yeah. thoughts, things, whatever that is in there and heal and feel and release that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely something I was curious about uh, in terms of, so the way that I see reality as such is there's events that happen and then there's how we react or respond to the events. And the way we react or respond isn't necessarily about the here and now. It's often about all the stuff from the past or in the unconscious so that's why I was really curious in terms of like oh shit this is big I wonder what it brought up for you you know because these kind of public shaming humiliation things yeah they can be seen as awful and horrific and da 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 but as soon as I got talking to you and you you called it an initiation right off the bat and for me that was a signal say like, oh she gets it she gets that this is actually a gateway this is a doorway and I wasn't surprised because you're a coach of course you know like this is right this is your business yeah. to understand how to deal with the shit that comes up and how to alchemize it um so as you're doing this are you still running your business still seeing clients running group programs launching your mastermind how did you manage both that and the emotional digestion dealing with the shit stuff mm, yeah so launched the mastermind stopped advertising it for about a a week and it and it started and we had two women in there started and then it became weekly so I was seeing them weekly every week and it was happening I didn't I didn't tell them about it because I was like I'm here for them we just started this new container full in service um I was seeing my one-on-one -on -one clients I had two one-on-one -on -one clients so yeah I was still seeing clients and I loved that because it kept me grounded to my purpose yeah. and the synchronicities of like with the women come would come to the call be like oh I'm scared of posting online you know and they, right. they, yeah it would like the mirror it was like I was coaching myself so I that's yeah. why I love I love coaching because it's a reflection and I see it and I get it and I I'm in their experience um and so yeah I was still working still coaching I stopped posting online and marketing the mastermind it started um but I was still full in my service just not putting myself out there anymore and then when mm. I did tell my clients about what happened they were like, whoa, they had all these questions. It brought up a bunch of fears for them. And then I got to help them work through it and go through it and alchemize it. And they got stronger. And so I know it was a ben it was an like immediate benefit for the people mm -hmm. that I was serving. Mm. Well, that's the mm -hmm. thing as a coach, right? Is that the more you've gone through, you know, if you run a bunch of businesses successfully, then like, then it's much easier to be a business coach, right? If you've walked your walk and you live it and you embody it as you go. So mm -hmm. in some ways it's like, yeah, the shitty thing happened, but man, it's really good for business because now I know what it's like to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so that original video in the pink hotel in the bikini, is it still up? Did you take it down? If you did take it's it down, still up. it's still it's up. It's still on my Instagram. I was like, you know what? I'm owning it. I'm owning that it's there and I'm owning that it wasn't fully aligned and I'm owning that I was high and yeah, it's, it's still there. So anyone can go and watch it and enjoy the, the highness of, of that. Uh, yeah. So when you rewatched it after it led to all the satire, 
and I'm being kind, I think, in calling what they did satire. But when you rewatch your own video, what did you see in it? Like, how did it make you feel watching yourself after it had been ripped off like that? Well, the initial right, the aftermath when I was still in the shit storm and in the emotion, there was a lot of judgment on myself of, oh, mm. you know, all those thoughts of like, oh, I'm so naive and stupid and young and immature, you know, like all these negative thoughts about myself and being like, oh, I should have trusted myself because there was a part where I was like, oh, you have a small vision. You know what I mean? Like I was almost like pain point marketing, like telling people that like, if you, you know, if you're not living your dream, then you have a, you have a mindset block on it and I can help you. You know, like that was the one part where I didn't feel very good. And you can tell, cause I'm like, uh, you know, I like, uh, and so when I watch it, I'm like, well, I wish I didn't do that. And, but I can reflect and I can learn and I can see of now I can watch that video and be like, yeah, that's funny. I was high. I was so floaty and in my energy, I'm like, cool. I love myself. <laughs> I fully yeah. accept myself. Um, mm -hmm. and I can look at that and be like, cool. Moving forward. I want to embody being grounded being present, being a woman, being in my power, being mm -hmm. more like here, knowing what I'm saying is coming from my heart with integrity, with passion, with purpose, mm. not just that. So yeah. I can watch it and refine. Yeah, I like that. I, and I can feel the difference in you too. You know, like um, I saw Lauren in the South Island at NZ for itself and then also at Evolve Festival. And it was beautiful to see you in person because you do have that epic shine, like, oh, let's go, rah, 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 that I really enjoy. And I can also feel that more, like you said, that sense of like, oh, now I'm going to ground and come into more maturity and have access to that as well. Because I reckon Kiwis need more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So when you reflect on it now, I mean, it sounds like you've alchemized and really kind of mined the whole thing for gold. Is there anything that you'd want to say to the owners of that particular account? Anything that you would want them to know? So the first thing I want to, I would say is thank you for allowing me to process and heal and unresolve trauma trigger inside of me to alchemize and move forward in my power. The next thing I would say is remember there's humans behind the screen. There's humans with feelings and we're sensitive. And so there needs to be a kindness. And I understand that you're on a mission and, you know, people with these accounts, they're on a mission and they're, they're here to prove something and they're here to, you know, to make a, to make something known. So I understand you're on a mission and yeah. Remember there are humans, be kind, look at your own stuff, see what, see what's in you that is causing you to be on this mission. Like where are there any projections? Um, and I'm still, I'm still going to do me. So fuck it. <laughs> Whatever you say, I'm, Fuck it. <laughs> I love it. And then for those people, because lots of people are experiencing this and I, you know, I feel this, this fear of like, fuck of showing up online. Cause obviously I shop a lot, but there's still this sense of like fear of showing up in particular ways or fear of what might happen or that, that's still there and I'm facing into it. What would you say to people that are afraid to shop online or to people that have been taken down in some way, shape, or form? Okay. Mm. It's kind of a two-part question. Yeah. Yeah. So first the, about the fear. Yeah. The fear is there to keep us safe. And it's the ego to keep us safe, right? Like the mind, okay, keep us safe. So fear is there as a protection. And when we go and we do big courageous things and we be brave and we stand for something bigger than ourselves, like we have a message, we have a mission, we have where it's bigger than us. When we stand for that and we put ourselves out there as the face of this message or mission, the fear is going to come up to keep us safe, like protect our ego, protect ourselves, protect our identity of sharing this stuff. Like, no, that's not. And so the fear is going to be there and, and the courage 
mm. needs to be there as well. The courage to be like, okay, whatever, I'm committed to my mission. I, I got me no matter what happens. I got me no matter what happens. I can process this and remembering and connecting to that larger mission of what you're really here for and what you're speaking and sharing about. Mm. And know that you might get you, you you might get misunderstood. You might get interpreted the wrong way. You might get criticized. You might get judged. You probably will, especially because a lot of the women that I work with are like revolutionary leaders in sexuality and money and creativity that we're changing the paradigm We're we're creating a whole new world of women empowered in their sexuality, earning money in their expressions. So this is a whole new paradigm, a whole new reality for the old way of playing small and being safe and being the good girl. It's like, we're breaking all of these paradigms. So of course there's fear because it's new. We're stepping up, we're stepping out. And the fear can still be there if we have the courage to just take action and move beyond the self, beyond our own, our own fears. So mm. that's how I think about it now to help me. Yeah. Kind of Even I'm still scared. I'm like, they could still attack me. They could still, they could still use anything that I'm using, but am I, is this my truth? Am I fully aligned, fully connected to what I'm saying? Mm. If so, then I'm going to speak, even if my voice shakes. Mm. I love how you connect it to what are you standing for? What is your message? What is your mission? Because to me, that feels like it does take it beyond the the individual as such. And it's about serving what one is standing for or serving the mission. It's like, yeah, I'm going to serve this and fuck you all. I ain't being quiet. I'm stepping up. Um, yeah, I like that a lot. I'm going to remember that. Okay. And for people that have gone through this kind of public shaming or humiliation because someone's done whatever with some of their online stuff what would you say to those people particularly younger like I, I've it's one thing for, for you and I to go through this and we've got all the tools and the understanding and the context and the practices what about teenage girls you know what about young people going through that because this stuff's happening a lot for young people yeah that yeah I feel like because the younger generation is so on social media now, TikTok and Instagram, it's so, it is so prevalent. And I know when I was young at that age, I didn't have the tools to do the processing. Like you said that we have now. Yeah. So I'm like, ah, oh, like I can't, I, I, it hurts my heart to think about, to, to connect to those girls. And it makes me like want to support and give them the tools. But what I would say is The first thing is like, whatever it brings up, like feel your feels, do not suppress or repress anything that it's bringing up for you because there's power in your feelings and expressing it and feeling it and having safe spaces with people to hold you so you can express and feel and release, feel your feelings, get, reach out for support for people that you trust, people that you love, who love you. And if this happens, Frame it as that it's an initiation for your growth, for you to be even more solid in who you are, to discover mm. yourself. I think the thing that really helped me that I always come back to are like my top five values. So like really remembering like what's important to you, like what yeah. is your guiding principles of how you live life and who you are and come continue to come back to those values. Mm. And and remember that your opinion of yourself, like what you think about yourself is the only one that really matters. How mm. you feel about yourself, how you feel about who you are in your heart and really being honest with, your, with yourself. And do I love who I am? Do I love who I'm becoming? Is this a vision of who I want to become? You know, really staying with that version of yourself that you want to embody and be. Mm. And those qualities you want to embody. Mm. Staying aligned with your vision, staying aligned with yourself, and and continue to be you because the world needs you. The world needs you, bright and big and bold, and who you are uniquely. And this is like a mantra now. Like not everyone's gonna like you, and that's okay. Mm. Not everyone's gonna like you, and that's okay. You could be the sweetest, juiciest, ripest peach in the whole world, and not everyone likes peaches. I know, right? This is something I'm really beginning to realize. I'm like, fuck, I'm the bad person in some people's stories. 
you know like I'm the best person in wow the yeah even though like I've done my best to like align to truth and love and for the well-being of all beings because like it's like it doesn't matter and some people's stories I'm still the bad person no matter what I do there's going to be people that don't like me that think x y and z about me and and those and their stories in their world I'm playing the villain yeah yeah and yeah. in a whole other people you're the you're the light you're the example of what's possible you know you're the permission slip right so in a whole nother world yes people are gonna people aren't gonna like you mm. I I know that I'm not for everybody I'm 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 outrageous I'm bold I'm bright I'm I'm you know like I'm all of it and some people are gonna fucking hate that and I get it and if you don't like it cool okay I love you bless you and you're not for me hey. I think that's a moment in terms of like not everyone is gonna get you but so these glasses that I wore if you saw my festival diaries I got these from Lauren. I'd lost my love heart glasses and we were at NZ Spirit South Island and she was wearing these. I'm like, oh my God, they're amazing. I wish I had some. She's like, well, I actually happen to have an extra bag here in my handbag. So she gave me a pair. And to me, that this is what it says is like, I'm unapologetically going to be the essence of who I am. And I wear these around tents. I'm not even at a festival. I just wear them walking down the street. <laughs> I forget that I'm wearing them because to me, they, these feel like, me I feel like an expression of me as I am <laughs> yes sister oh, I love <laughs> unapologetic the glasses. unapologetic right unapologetic. unapologetic essence who the fuck are you and be that now I just you know I love what you just said there three half me look what look through these glasses while I'm on screen um <laughs> let's do that um I just want to acknowledge that sometimes it's impossible to reach out you know like if there's attachment style um, trauma around the very act of reaching out, it can actually be impossible when we're in the darkness to reach out, you know? And so I think that's the thing. And then the other aspect is if young people are going through this, it's one thing to say, you know, your opinion is the most important, but when you're young, it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like other people define us. Other pe If other people don't like us, it's the worst thing in the world, you know? Yeah. It absolutely yeah. is. Um, yeah. And there isn't the other thing, the other aspect, like I'm 47 now, so I have context. I have years of context. <laughs> um, but when you're younger, when you're only 18 or 15 or 13, you don't have those years of context to understand that if it feels like shit right now, if you're getting grief because of who you show up as, it will get better. It will change. You will find your tribe. There are people that yeah. are going to love the fuck out of you for who you are. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. the thing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Good reminder. Lauren, you any will final... find your... Yeah, you will find your people. Um, you'll find and... them and you'll see them all the way. And you'll be like, to recognize them because they've got the glasses on or whatever it is. Maybe it's the matching tattoos or the similar dance moves. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So you've come through this huge public humiliation, shaming. You framed it as an initiation. You did the work. You've come out the other side. Any final words that you would like to share with your audience around this whole issue as a global collective mm. thing? Because yeah, it's big. Mm. I know that's a big question, Lauren. Just mm. drop us the wisdom for the global collective around shame on social media. <laughs> mm. There's this quote that's coming through. It's like, your shame is the greatest source of your power. Mm -hmm. And when you can own the shit that people say about you or the shit that you don't like about yourself or that you ignore, that you repress or that you, you know, if you just can own that, be like, this is me, this is my shit, you know, doing the work on yourself and then just owning it. Yeah, you'd be unfuckwithable. Unfuckwithable. <laughs> Yeah. Fuck with the ball. I yeah. love that. I freaking love it. And I, you know, like when I came out of the psych ward in 2004 and I started blogging in 2006, like when blogging was still a thing, that was it. I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to claim the fact that I experienced psychosis, that I ended up in a psych ward and I'm going to claim it so no one else can shame me. Because if I'm claiming it, what are they going to do? Oh, you ended up in the psych ward. Yeah, I did. And so what? Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah, everybody knows that already. Cool. What else? What else you got? I know. You know what, what I mean? Like, yeah. What else you got? 
<laughs> I know it. I own it. You know, like, uh, yeah. So that's it. I love that. I love that. You've experienced that. You know that. And it's just, just own it. Own it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, please, yeah. Lauren. Thank you so much for coming on Conversations with Carolia and having such an yeah. epic conversation with me. I love your magic. I love what you bring. And I'm really, you, you are only still 29, you know, like you're literally almost two decades younger than me. That's like, whoa. So I'm really curious to see how you grow, the power you step into, who you be, you know, as you come into your 30s and 40s. And thanks for being unapologetically you. Yeah yes and this was like i said this initiation and thank you for yeah having me on the show it's been so good i love getting into the juice of it and really like dissecting the whole process and the whole experience and yeah being unapologetically me i know this initiation happened when it happened because i've been already getting ready to launch my new show the lauren hill show yeah. on youtube <laughs> right so i've been yeah. like getting ready for that and now i'm like okay there's probably going to be haters. There's probably going to be criticism, but I'm just going to be me as big and unapologetic as I can. And that's, I don't know when you're going to post this episode, but it's the first episode of the Lauren Hill show is releasing on February 27th. So next a week from today, which mm -hmm. is so exciting. And I'm just, yeah, I'm ready to just keep, keep bringing it even more full power than before. So um, yeah, I hope this resonated with people who needed to hear it support you on yeah. your journey if you're a revolutionary and a change maker continue to share your magic and your message because people need it people need yeah. you and yeah I'm, yeah I'm here to be that to do that <laughs> all right people that was lauren hill i freaking love these glasses and i love the energy that lauren brings and i love how she was able to totally own the way she showed up on that video in terms of going, yeah, I wasn't that grounded and it was out of alignment and I did use pain point marketing, which I don't normally do. And I did have second thoughts about it, but I still published it, you know? So that sense of like, she's taking responsibility, taking ownership of her side. And then she's doing all the work around all the stuff that it brought up. But do you notice how she had no, she wasn't blaming the other guys. Uh, she wasn't resentful toward them. There wasn't anger. There wasn't rage. There wasn't a sense of like, we should have laws against this thing happening. It was just all about, this is what it brought up for me. This is how I alchemized it. This is the gold I bring now. This is how it's helped me serve my clients. And I love that. I think that's freaking amazing. Um, and I, at this, you know, the way that she was like, yeah, this is the perfect thing to happen. It was just what I needed. And I get that. But I also think it's really important to remember that when we're on our keyboards, that if you're writing things, just remember, there is always a human with a beating heart who is going to be reading that comment, right? Would you say it to them in person? You know, if it was someone that you loved dearly, would you say it in that same way? Or would you frame it with a bit more kindness? You know, it just takes a moment to really drop in and to feel the person that you're communicating with and one thing I've noticed online I feel like the online world has been a, become a way that we unconsciously vent or get out all of our unprocessed emotions and it's just like it's like a giant kind of dumping ground it's like no don't do that take responsibility for your shit neutralize your shit digest your shit and when you're online and you're commenting etc come from heart why not you know, why not come from heart and let's decrease the amount of suffering in this world by just loving each other a little bit more, even if it's online, even if you don't know the person, even if you don't agree with the person, even if you think the person's views are abhorrent, it doesn't mean that you can't come from kindness and from love, even whilst you are disagreeing with their perspective or the way that they see the world. Alrighty. So my name is Carolia. This is Conversations with Carolia. We talk about all things, as you know, related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. And I'm going to be back next week with another amazing guest. I don't quite yet know who it's going to be, but I have some really fascinating people lined up for you. So if you haven't already, make sure that you like, that you share, that you follow and share the love. Share this out with anyone that you know who's gone through something similar. Share this out with the young people that you know who are dealing with this kind of stuff online way more just because of the nature of the online world. Alrighty, big love to you all. 
Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia. And trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.